Well, thanks for having me. It's a different perspective than most of the tech podcasts that, that, that I deal with. And I think it's it's really important to take a sort of broader philosophy powered view of these things because I mean as as lame and confusing as philosophy is, it manages in some ways to get a higher level of abstraction than any other intellectual discipline that we have. And we need that level of abstraction when we're dealing with, with a world that's leaping beyond the previously known, you know, with, with, with such astounding rapidity. Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. I'm your host, Parker Set a Case, and this is a podcast where we explore all the deepest ideas in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. This episode is very, very special. I have with me for the second time, Dr. Ben Gertzel. Dr. Gertzel is an AI theorist, philosopher, cognitive scientist, just an all-around thinky type person. He's awesome. In this episode, he schools me on artificial intelligence, the philosophy of artificial general intelligence. We get into the ins and outs of his own program, OpenCog Hyperon and Cognitive Synergy. Don't worry, we're going to explain some of that crazy stuff. And of course, we have to get into machine consciousness. Is it possible for robots to be conscious like us? What theory of mind would make that true? All that good stuff. If you guys enjoy this podcast, then please consider supporting me on Patreon. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, you can become a YouTube member. There's different perks at different levels. Everything helps. I also have new sponsors that I've pulled over from my Park Notes channel. If you guys haven't checked out Park Notes, you can find a link in the description. But you can also find links to my sponsors in the description of this video. So please check them out. They're awesome. I wouldn't be sponsored by them if I didn't love them. But that's probably enough commodification. Let's jump in with Ben Gertzel in round two talking about artificial general intelligence. All right. So Ben, thanks for coming back on the podcast, man. Yeah. Good to be back. Yeah. Um. So last time we talked about AGI and maybe the concept of it, and we went all over the place, which was fantastic. This time... I thought maybe we could start with just um, a, a quick understanding of AGI for those who didn't see the first episode or who, who are unfamiliar. Sam Altman said that AGI is something like median uh, human intelligence. And I wondered maybe we could start from there as a jumping off point. Do you, do you agree with that? Do you have a different conception that's uh, a quick for people to understand? I don't think median human intelligence really says much of anything from a sort of cognitive science or AGI research view. It, it's a meaningful way to look at it from a business and, and economic standpoint. But I think it, that phrasing perhaps doesn't make the distinctions you want to make from a, from a cognitive science and AGI theory point of view. So that the notion of AGI or artificial general intelligence is that of an AI system that can take a substantial sort of imaginative, speculative, hypothetical leap beyond the data that, that it's been trained on and beyond the programming that it's been given, right? And this is the ability to generalize. And, you know, human beings clearly are not great at that. We fail at it most of the time, but we have historically had an ability to do that. Otherwise, we would never have gotten out of the African savanna and, and, and the Stone Age and, 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 and so forth, right? So one of the confusing things in the history of, of, of AI has been that for most particular things that you want an AI system to do, you can prepare an AI system just to do that thing without the AI system needing to take a big speculative leap to get there, right? So through most of the history of AI, this is what we call narrow AI programs, right? So say Deep Blue plays chess, AlphaGo plays Go, you know, early medical diagnostic expert systems in the 80s and 90s could take in medical indicators, predict if you had, had a disease. And, you know, UAVs can be piloted by AI control systems. These things may be difficult to do, but you're configuring the AI to do that particular thing. So we then made a distinction, Cassio Panache and I, in a book we published in 2005, we made a distinction between 
AGI, AI that can generalize beyond its preparation, and narrow AI, which is AI closely configured to do one thing. Now, what's what's wreaked a little havoc with this distinction lately? Getting back to Sam Altman, what what's wreaked a little havoc with this distinction is large language models and other such systems, which in a way are narrow, but in a way are general and broad. And the, the thing is, these systems cannot take big speculative, imaginative leaps beyond their training data and initial code. They stick pretty close to what they were prepared with. On the other hand, their training data consists of everything on the internet, right? So, I mean, they're, I mean, their right. training data, it's so much of what humanity has done to date that they don't need to go that far beyond the training data to do a lot of the things that people do. And so that's, that's what vexes me about a statement like, you know, AGI being achieving median human intelligence. So that the, the, the thing is that being able to do most of the things that a human being does right now, and even most of the kinds of special case learning in different domains human beings do right now, this seems like something that could happen with incremental improvements of LLMs and, and associated deep neural net technologies. However, such systems are not going to take a big leap beyond what they've been prepared with. So like if they were if they were trained only on classical physics, they will never invent quantum physics. If they were trained only on music up to the year nineteen hundred, they will never invent jazz fusion and neoclassical metal, right? So I I mean that they're they're in a way very general that they can do a lot of the things people can do, but they cannot generalize if if effective effectively, right? And and that that's uh it's a fine grained point to pack into a sound bite. Right? So when you when That's you true. are looking at when you're looking at could an AI do what a median person does, the thing is you could make an AI without too much AGI, you could make an AI do ninety percent, maybe ninety eight percent of what most people do in their jobs. And with increasing cost as you get into different verticals, right? On the other hand, still the average person, even if they don't leverage it in their everyday life much, still the average person has a sort of creative, speculative, imaginative capability that LMs don't have. And part of what confuses it is, you know, most people in their everyday life don't leverage this ability to imagine and, right. and right. generalize too too much, but we we all have that potential in our brains. It's just not what our culture is 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 driving us to to do every day in, in, in most cases. Yeah, that that's such a good answer. Following up on on the generalizability, I wonder from a cognitive science type perspective, I know you've you've taught that before in university. Do you see the ability to generalize as being more involved in mo ha having more to do with imagination or more to do with like logical inference? Does the ability to generalize fall into one of those? Does it require both the, the cognitive synergy maybe that, that you uh, proposed in your own AGI, AGI systems? I think, I mean, I would say, of course, in the human mind, it has to do with both if i had and and they sort of handle it in different ways which is is interesting so the the ability to imagine of course this is the foundation of how the human mind takes a creative leap right like if if, if i if i'm saying closing a song at the, at the at the piano or something right i mean what if I come up with something really wild and different than what I heard before, it usually 
just pops into my head like, oh, hear about this. Like I, I just hear the thing in my head that I play. I don't know where the hell it pop, popped up from out of my unconscious mind, right? It's just, it's just some generative imagination, which is certainly quite different than what mu- music gen or other uh, models for music do now, which is sort of derivatively combined together their training data. Like I'm less reliably competent than those are, but at my best, I come up with something that's like more weird and wildly different than what's been done been done before. So that that faculty of imagination is certainly key to how humans do generalization. On the other hand, you know what a formal system like logic does, or like mathematics, or or, or science, or or you could talk about law or formal systems of philosophy. What formal systems do, I mean, these let you generate something multiple steps beyond where you where you started, right? So I mean that they're they're amazing amplifiers of imagination, you might say. Like you can you can imagine a new logical axiom and that's cool. But then you turn the crank of a logical reasoning system and after multiple derivations, you will get something incredible that you yourself did not Im- imagine, right? And that, and you can see the same in music theory. Like if, if you come up with a cool new melody involving some weird harmonies or implicit harmonies people don't usually use, then that's cool. It maybe way out there it sounds interesting there's a whole bunch of of music and song structure you can you can bring you're like okay well what chord will match with this like then then what would harmonize with that well what would be a good b section to go with that part of the song but all that theory of music lets you amplify a little bit of imagination into a lot more creativity right and that and that's a, a major invention on the part of human culture, right? So if you, if, if you look in Stone Age society, their formal systems were much weaker. And so their imagination was there, but it didn't get amplified in the way that's happened in, in, in modern culture, which has to do with development of science and technology, but also with the development of art and literature and so many amazing music and so many amazing complex directions right so cer- certainly certainly both aspects are important I, I mean of course if you had to pick one the imaginative facility is certainly more key i mean it's all this self-organizing churning of the unconscious that's popping up creative new leaps but that only goes in a certain Great. If you don't have a formal system to to amplify it, right? And this 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 then is an amazing creative leap on the part of human culture. Like we're the only species to invent formal systems, right? And I, I mean, having that 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 invention, that invention obviously just powers so many so many other in, 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 in inventions, right? Like uh, we. We create mathematics. We we create, you know, standardized ways of making machine parts to fit to fit together. And creating these formal systems. That's what brings us computers and, and AG, AG, AGIs and so forth. Like you, you can almost say once once a species, once a species gets the ability to create formal systems that, that sort of derive step by step by step from the information provided once you have that if you're in a reasonably flexible environment you're almost guaranteed to create a singularity after some point in time because formal mm. systems will, wow formal systems will lead to universal computation which will lead to agi which will lead to singularity wow that's a that's an incredible way to think about it it's the systems and uh, you could look at that for for probably every boom in uh industrial in, in industrialization, someone has a concept, it explodes uh, because it's because the system uh, opens up other systems and more and more. Yeah, you can go, I mean, go yeah. like like 
drawing in pers- drawing in perspective was 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 a formal system, right? And I mean, arithmetic was a formal system. The, the, these these go way back, but certainly in the industrial revolution, you know, you know, the interchangeability of machine parts allowed you to treat engineering in a much more formal rather than one-off way. Like the reason Charles Babbage never built the analytical engine, which would have been the first general purpose computer, was largely that screws and nuts and bolts were not standardized then. Like everyone was a little different. You know, wow. We need, that, we need to build something with all wow. these screws. To, and like if each one is a little bit different weights, it will just take you so, so, so long. Huh. So that standardization, standardization lets you make a sort of formal system of, of hardware engineering. I mean, we see where that is. Led. Yeah. I was going to ask you about Babbage. So I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, I, I have so far, I've, I've been looking back on the history of AI and I, I see, uh, Ada Lovelace, uh, talking about, uh, a new age of, of scientific music and scientific, you know, advancement and maybe like a proto, uh, singularity. Uh, I don't know what, what you're kind of the singularity guy. You might, you might, uh, disagree with that, but th- then be, before her, I saw like Descartes talking about it, but he was just talking about how we would ever be able to tell the difference between an automata and uh, and a human. I don't know. Have you seen it go back any further? And do you think of like is is Ada Lovelace? Is she the the grandmother of AI? I mean, thousands of years BC, Chinese were allegedly building you know, metal walking robots that impersonated people. So, I mean, the, the, the idea that you could automate thought processes through complex gears and, and pulleys and, and whatnot goes back well into the, into the BC era, right? Now, now the frame of mind to actually engineer that wasn't quite there then. Look at the claim was that these ancient Chinese robots were actually built and walking around. I'm, 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 a, I'm a bit skeptical, but the, there was the vision that the power of machinery could extend to do what humans could do. Like we're, we're from a certain perspective, a, a big complicated machine. So I, th- I think that existed across many cultures, particularly in, in ancient China and, and, and India, right? And I guess with by the time you got to Babbage and Lovelace, engineering was getting more advanced. But of course, if you look at the history of engineering and, you know, in 1200, 1300, 1400, it was China who was building all the complex machines. Then, then they had an emperor who shut it down because he was afraid it would destabilize society. But arguably some of these machines made their way to Italy and help see the Renaissance and so forth. Right. So, I mean, I, I think all this was, all this has been building up globally in human culture for quite a long time. Of course, I mean, Ada Lovelace was great. Ba- ba- Babbage, Babbage was great. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be great, right? The jury's still out, but on the other hand, mm-hmm. in the end, <laughs> this is a process. Global culture as a whole is 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 doing and the same insights pop up in different permutations and in so many different places wow that's that's so cool well since we mentioned china i i wanted to ask you about that a little bit too um when i heard you give a talk or two at mindfest 2023 last year you had talked about maybe it was one of the q a sessions you talked about the mentality between the east and the west and how in the West, we many of us think of Terminators and you know robots taking over and destroying us all. And in the East, the mentality is much more like a harmonious one where we're going to get along with robots. Um, did I get that right, first of all? And then second of all, do you, any insight, if that is right? Um, why, why, why the divergent views on how we'll integrate with AI? Um, certainly, I think that observation, it's so correct. The default sort of ambient assumption in Asia seems to be that robots will be our friends and AIs as well will help 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 us all. And uh, the default assumption in the US 
in particular seems driven by Hollywood movies and, 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 and seems to be a AI will be that's there will murder her and, and, and enslave us or something. Now the the deep cultural reasons for this, I mean this is a subject for speculation and that and that deep, deep investigation, but you, you, you could see that Chinese culture it's sort of as the idea that nature and the universe are a self stabilizing system, right? So the Chinese culture is sort of believed you know, the dynasty will rise and fall, then rise and, and, and fall again. And they're definitely viewing robots and AIs as part of the order of nature, not outside outside of the the order of of nature. I th I th I think uh, there's probably more aspects to it than that. Though I I know. If you look at how Asians versus Westerners interpret pictures, one finding that's very well known is Westerners tend to fixate on whatever is in the foreground of the picture. Asians will tend to describe what's in the background of the picture instead. In, in so like if you're looking at a picture of an aquarium, Westerners will tend to identify the biggest fish in front. An Asian will be more likely to point out that the growth of plants in the, in the, in the background in, in, in the aquarium or, or something. And I think this, this probably, probably relates in that Asians are more thinking about the robots and AIs as manifestations of the whole global brain on, on, on the planet. Like what's the background of data and processing that's, that's feeding into, feeding into this AI mind. So the AI mind like a robot or that system you interact with, it's like the tip of the iceberg popping up, but the whole iceberg is like all of human culture and our whole global infrastructure. We tend in the West to focus more on like, here's the Terminator, here's Sophia, like here's here's the the protagonist who on their own is destroying everything or or or, or conquering the world, right? And I, I think that that relates somehow. I, I also, I wouldn't say the Asian mentality is in every way more insightful here. I mean, I mean, I, I think that Chinese philosophy, while very profound and intriguing, it did emerge in an era where things were more stable than they, than they are now, right? And Chinese philosophy being the root Korean Japanese thinking as well, and Indian philosophy, the Vedas, and all that also originated in an era where things were much more stable than than they are now. So you you could argue that these philosophies and the psychological complexes associated with them, they're not fully embracing exponential change and 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 and, and the modern era right so that i think there's some unique insight the west has by being more future oriented and less past oriented and by being less grounded in such a long history the west in some ways is more able to come to terms with the current moment for for what it is on the other hand the western mentality also overfits to the short term because because it's not as grounded in the in the long, long slip of, of, of history, which is, is really an argument why you want all of these perspectives to contribute to our, our, our understanding of the present and the future. Yeah. Well, that's, um, I, I'm, it's hard for me not to smile because I'm enjoying this so much. I love talking with you. I, you've spent 10 years over in China. Was that right? In Hong Kong. Yeah. Which is, is uh, Hong Kong. Is, okay. According to the Chinese government, it's China. No, 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 Hong Kong, he's feel that way. Sure, yeah, yeah sorry. My, sorry my wife, yeah, my wife is mainland Chinese, and we met at Shaman University in, in, in mainland China. So I, I've had a bunch of connections in the mainland China AI community, and then her, her PhD supervisor was also a Zen Buddhist master from... from uh, Zen Buddhist order in, in Hangzhou. So I've seen a bit of that side of 
of modern China as well. That's awesome. I I wonder, I wonder if you ever struggle uh, personally with the AI like arms race of it all, um, because it seems you you just brought together these two perspectives. The West is future focused and maybe more like hurried. We don't have as long of a, a history, whereas the Chinese could look at you know some statue and be like this this predates all of us and it'll be here way longer than me and they can have a a broader well, perspective Chinese government is very big hurry Chinese government is a very big hurry on AGI right now I mean there, there are probably a hundred different LMs trained in China in the last year and maybe 50 75 conferences with AGI as a major theme in the last year in mainland China so I mean that they're, they're they're in a big hurry on AGI right now. They're also trying hard to develop AGI in a way that they can control and constrain it according to their interests, which, of course, U.S. government and big U.S. tech companies also want to do, although you might argue Chinese government is better at control and constraint of advanced technologies. But in terms of the AI race, I pretty much see the race as being between centralized versus decentralized modes of developing AGI rather than like West versus China or, 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 or something. Because I, I mean, I think both in China and in the US, you have an attempt by large companies working closely with military and intelligence agencies to dominate the emergence of, of AGI. And on the other side of that, you have open and decentralized networks, which are also playing a large role in the advance of AI now, right? Like research advances underlying AI are posted in papers on, on artsite.org. They're free for everyone to read. Most advanced AI code is posted open source on GitHub or Git, GitLab or somewhere else, even, even if developed in China, right? So, so, I mean, you have, and you've seen with LLMs, which are not AGI, but interesting, right? You've seen there, okay, you've got big proprietary models. You then have models like Llama or, or Mixtrol, which are almost as good as the best proprietary models. And they're open models and the code for training them is open, but the data on which they were trained is not, not open. Right. So you, you have an interesting, interesting sort of back and forth between the decentralized and the centralized modes of advance of, of AI. Now within, within the centralized approach, if that flourishes more. Yeah, then, then you're left with a sort of Tweedledum versus Tweedledee thing of like Chinese government hegemony versus U U.S. government hegemony. My my guess is if centralized wins, then in the end, you know, the Chinese autocrats will make a deal with the Western oligarchs and you'll, you'll, you'll just have like a global centralized AGI detente or something like I, 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 I don't, I don't think you're going to see like an AGI world, world war three. What, what worries me more is a global AGI fascist state with the collaboration of the oligarchs and autocrats in the, in the West and and and, and, and the East. And I, 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 I'm more concerned to see the decentralized mode of development grow relative to the centralized mode in an AI context. And I would say there, the situation is different in the West and in the East. I mean, like utility tokens and, and crypto networks are mostly illegal in, in mainland China. And just due to culture and the attitude of the investment community there, there's not as many sort of upstart AGI initiatives in mainland China as in the West. In China, it's even more centralized in a few big, big companies. And in China, 
the ties between the big companies and the military and intelligence world are even closer. I mean, Google, Microsoft, and NSA, and all that's certainly very buddy buddy, as is aptly documented. On the other hand, Chinese government can literally commission the top AI developers in Alibaba, Baidu, or Tencent to work on top secret Intel data, and that that doesn't happen so directly in in in, in the West, right? So I I do think I do think there are differences there, and the West the West is more likely to be where decentralized AGI emerges from because China has clamped down on decentralized stuff much harder than, than, than the West has. I mean, the West is trying, but we're not very good at it, right? Like, I mean, we, we, haven't, we haven't managed to squash BitTorrent. I can still download movies on, 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 on BitTorrent. Right? And that's, I mean, so we, we're, we're not that good at, in the end, fully clamping down on decentralized, chaotic stuff in the West, especially in, in, in the U.S., which I'm very glad of. Totally, yeah. Um, I, I had Summer Bringshord on the podcast, and we just mentioned you very briefly, and he mentioned you as someone who is wise. He's like, Ben Ben knows all this stuff. Ben is very wise. There's, he said there's not very many wise people in the uh, in the AI communities, um, but you're you're definitely one of them. And uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm misquoting him. So I, oh, he's not putting everyone on blast, but he was just mentioning that you're a wise person. And I, I wanted to see what your thoughts were on wisdom and uh, and robots. Can 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 an AGI system uh, be wise? And if so, you know maybe someone makes an AGI with one purpose in mind, a, a nefarious purpose, but the AGI is more wise than that and, and changes its mind. Is that is that a possibility? Yeah, I think, I mean, of course, all these natural language terms like intelligence and and wisdom and consciousness are quite complicated. And when you try to make them precise, they boil down into a great number of, of derivative sub-meanings. But I mean, if, if I want to take a simplified view of what wisdom is about, it seems largely to be about looking at the particular problem in front of you in a much broader context in, a, in an effective way. And this is part of why at, at their best, old people can be really good at, at wisdom because they, you know, they've seen a lot of stuff in their life relative to younger people so that they're able to see the current situation in the context of a much broader historical flow of, of events. But of course, it's not just about time. If, if you've been experienced in many different cultures, that can help give you more wisdom because you, you will see that what seems like a hopeless problem may just be you know, a manifestation of some peculiarity of one particular culture. I mean, d d d just as you know, observing that the American obsession with the Terminator is perhaps says more about U.S. cultural psyche than about AI. I mean, this is not a very profound observation, but it's a little bit of wisdom, which comes from having a broader scope and looking at, at other cultures. So, I, I, and wisdom also comes from stepping away from your own self-interest, right? And then and, and thinking like, well, okay, it feels it feels bad to me that you know this particular village is being mowed down to make to make room for a dam or something but on the other end in the broader view the dam is bringing electricity to to a lot of people so i'm going to step aside my self-centered situated view so if, if you view wisdom as being about bringing the broader context spatially temporally culturally in multiple senses bring the broader context for a particular problem i would say ais have potential to do much better at that than people because we have a narrow context by default, by design, right? I, I mean, we, we, our brains are stuck in these bodies and we evolved so that the body would survive and reproduce. Whereas an AI 
could have, you know, visibility from cameras and microphones all over the entire planet. And the AI could also control multiple different kinds of, of, of bodies, right? And what this means is that in theory, the AI should have a much broader scope of perception, action, and understanding than a human, and also should be less attached to any one avenue for manifesting its intelligence. Like, I'm attached to this body because, you know, if this body dies, then, you know, either my individuality is dead or it exists only in some more diffuse form outside this universe to pop into its next incarnation or something. But I lose a lot if this body dies, right? And AI will not necessarily... And the AI will not necessarily lose that much if any one robot body dies. So through through breadth of scope and through having lesser attachment, I would say an AGI could achieve more easily a higher degree of wisdom than than a person, or at least have a more straightforward route to achieving a high high level of of wisdom. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if you can really rank wisdom versus wisdom on some linear scale. There's going to be very many different kinds of, of, of wisdom. And of course, of course, a very wise human may have a different species of wisdom than a very wise, wise AGI. They're not necessarily in, in, in competition or entirely commensurate with each other. But I would say AGI is not guaranteed to be wise. If you create an AGI whose goal and whose design is to be a soldier for the U.S. Army and kill the enemy and defend the homeland, or if you create an AGI whose only goal is to make more money for your company, and who, which by design subordinates everything to the goal of making more money for its company, I mean, this, this AGI will not automatically be wise just because it has a broad, it has a broad scope of, of, of perspective, right? I mean, I, I, w- I would say... There's a bias toward wisdom on the part of AGI more so than with humans because of the factors I've outlined, but it's not like a hundred percent non overridable bias. We can override it by being perverse and stupid, which in, in fact, in fact, there are many powerful forces currently trying to do quite precisely to make smarter and smarter machines whose goal is to make their company money or to defend their national interest against others, right? So AGI wisdom is ours to fuck up, and we're out of resources precisely in the top right. <laughs> Man, that's tough. Um, when it comes to when it comes to your system, OpenCog Hyperon, um, you've you've described a cognitive synergy between at least three types of well, uh, cognitive framework, I guess, L- LLMs, large language models, uh, logic systems uh, including many different types of logics and uh like an an evolutionary component uh, for creativity i wonder how how important is the development of llms and probably that 2017 attention is all you need paper how important do you think that is in reaching uh agi could, could llms be like a wrong turn in 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 agi that we look you know, 40, 50, 100 years from now and say, oh, we are all caught up in transformer models, but that was the wrong turn. Is that, is, do you think that's possible or is this an integral step? I think LMs are not necessary to achieve human level general intelligence. And I think that just trying to tinker with and directly sort of improve LLMs is probably a bad route to building human level general intelligence. It's either an impossible or a very, very slow and expensive route. On the other hand, I think given that LLMs exist and so much money is being put into them, I mean, I think leveraging them is probably part of the optimal path to human level AGI. So if you wanted to ask all the money put into deep neural nets and LLMs, if you put that into OpenCog instead, 
would we have an AGI already? Yes, I think I think we would. So I, I don't think it was the most. If your goal was beneficial AGI, I don't think putting all these resources in the LLMs was the best thing to do. On the other hand, conditional on that being there, I mean, they have a lot to add to a would-be AGI system. And it's interesting to think about that. Plug them in to your would-be AGI system to help with some progress. I mean, uh, uh, you could ask similar things about many other technologies, like is, is the von Neumann computer architecture good or bad for AI, right? Like on, on the one hand, you know, maybe if we develop massively parallel, like MIMD, multiple structure, multiple data stream parallelism, like the con Danny Hollis's connection machine from the 80s or something, or the transputer. Maybe if we hadn't done von Neumann, would it develop some sort of massively parallel infrastructure with hundreds of thousands and millions of autonomous processors, billions of them, we would have gone faster toward, toward AGI, quite possibly. On the other hand, that doesn't mean you don't want to use von Neumann computers since they're here. And you, I mean, you can say the same about internal combustion engine. Like, was, was internal combustion engine bad? I mean, if we didn't have it, would we have just moved straight toward hydrogen power cars and electric cars? Ma ma like, maybe, but I mean, since, since internal combustion engines are here at the moment, it makes sense to use them. Like r right now, if you're in Chicago, you're better off with a hybrid vehicle than a pure electric vehicle because it's so cold, your Tesla's battery won't, char won't charge, right? So, I mean, I, I, I think I try to be pragmatic and idealistic and try to find some dynamic, hopefully not too chaotic balance between them, right? So from a pure idealistic view, you totally don't need LLMs. It's not the best way to work toward AGI. For a pragmatic view, they're here, they're super cool, they do a lot of things. You know, if we can glom them on together with with other AI systems that are more capable of imagination and reasoning and generalization, I mean, that may help us get to human-level AGI faster. Cognitive synergy, I think, is a more general principle, which does have application in the context of LLMs and logic engines and evolutionary learning systems, such as, as you mentioned. The general principle underlying cognitive synergy seems is that seems to be that given limited resources to do smart stuff different kinds of smart stuff are best achieved by different kinds of algorithms and that you know that might not be the case if you have enough resources and you can make a god mind or maybe maybe with enough resources an AI system is just given a new problem, then maybe you can on the fly synthesize a special algorithm to deal with that problem, right? So maybe and its core algorithm is wildly general purpose. But given given limited resources, such as the human brain has, and such as our current practical AI systems running on the server farms we now have, you know, given realistically limited resources and our current scheme of biological and technical development, it seems that different kinds of problems are better addressed by different kinds of algorithms. So like, it, I mean, it seems like if you want to prove a math theorem or derive a complex scientific conclusion, it seems like you're probably doing best to use something resembling a logic engine. And it seems like if you want to create radically new stuff, making having no big resemblance to what you fit in, it seems like evolutionary algorithms are good at that. On the other hand, it seems like if you want to generate something that's drawn from the distribution of a large body of data that you have at your disposal, it seems like deep neural nets, such as, you know, 
and models and transformer and all that so are, 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 are good at that, right? So that current scheme of things for AI technology seems to be that certain sorts of tech are really good for doing certain sorts of things. Even people deeply vested in LLMs can see that, which is why there is a Wolfram Alpha plugin for GPT-4, right? Because if you want to do algebra or you want to prove a theorem, GPT-4 sucks at it. Wolfram Alpha is better at it. So you want to write a prompt, take stuff from the LLM, feeds it to Wolfram Alpha, gets the answer back, uses that to make a new prompt to feed the LLM and so on. So now you're acknowledging right now Wolfram Alpha is better at number crunching and algebra crunching and theorem proving. LLMs are, are, are better at answering natural language questions based on a huge amount of diffuse unstructured data for, for, for exa example, right? So if this is the case that different kinds of hard problems are better addressed by different kinds of algorithms, then you have the question, what's the best way to combine different kinds of algorithms, right? And the, so the way that OpenAI is doing it is very modular. Like, oh, GPT-4 will feed a query to Wolfram Alpha, which will crunch, get an answer, feed the answer back to GPT-4 and so forth. So these are black boxes, as you call them in, in the AI field. They're distinct, opaque modules. Now, if you look how the brain works, the brain uses different sub-networks and subsystems to perform different sorts of intelligent processing, right? So the brain, say, to deal with spatial data, the hippocampus has a bunch of grid cells which deal with a sort of top-down 2D map of, 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 of the world, like the top-down view you get if you're like hovering overhead in a video game or something. On the other hand, for example, parietal cortex has face-centered map and eye-centered maps of the world and some, some processing associated with that, with like the, the first person view, right? The thing is, as the brain implements these things, these are not totally modularized, but they're connections wherein processing done on the top-down view in the hippocampus can help guide processing done using the eye-centered and face-centered views in the parietal cortex and vice versa. So you have neural connections that are, are manifesting synergetic cooperative processing between different networks in the brain, centered in different parts of the brain, doing different kinds of specialized processing. And this example I gave with different sorts of space maps is quite simple, but the same thing occurs between, say, visual and auditory processing. There's crosstalk between visual and auditory cortex. That means what you see affects what you hear. What you hear affects what you see at a quite low level. Now, if you, if you look, on the other hand, at logical reasoning versus visual imagination, the parts of the brain doing logical reasoning and the parts of the brain doing visual imagination have a lot of cross-connection and crosstalk between each other. So that what we visualize affects how we reason and vice versa, step by step in the middle of the visualization and reasoning process, rather than just visualization and reasoning being separate modules and exchange queries and answers with each other. So that the way to abstractly put this is a limited resources mind containing multiple modules carrying out multiple specialized intelligent algorithms, it will do better if the multiple specialized algorithms can share their intermediate states with each other while they're in the middle of doing processing and then give each other guidance and feedback on each other's intermediate states. And if you, if you think about how a group of students working together on a physics problem will work, it's like that. or Say a bunch of bandmates writing a song together. It, 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 it's like that. It's not like, it's not like the bass player comes up with a completed bass part, feeds it to the, to the guitar player, comes with a completed guitar part. They then feed that 
or to the keys player who adds the chords on. Like you, you can do it that way, but you can also be like, well, boom, 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 how's this? Like, oh, that's cool, but maybe, maybe, uh, you know, maybe add some eyebrows on that, right? And and you you can go back and forth at the granular level in the middle of each other's process, right? And I, I think that's harder to engineer is why most AGI attempts now have modular components. But I think there's a huge upside of efficiency if you can get this crosstalk between different modules. And there's a huge upside of creativity also there because a lot of creativity within the human mind and among humans comes from that crosstalk, right? Like in, in human imaginative creativity, if our visualization facility and our logical reasoning facility work together, I mean, this can lead us to come up with wild stuff that would take a lot longer to come, come up with by just visualization and just reasoning working as modules. And then in, say, a band coming up with, 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 with new music, I mean, you can do things in a more modularized way. But on, on the other hand, if you look at, say, look at Bitches Brew by Miles Davis in a way, the first jazz fusion album, right? I mean, how did they invent jazz fusion? I mean, it was those guys jam, jamming, jamming together, right? I mean, it was McLaughlin on guitar and, and uh, you know, M Miles on, 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 on trumpet, but they were feeding off each other, driving each other's creativity in a way that just went, it went faster. And it went out there creatively faster because of the crosstalk, right? And that's what we're trying to do with cognitive synergy. So if you have a logic reasoning engine and an evolutionary learning engine, the thing is when the logical reasoning engine is in the middle of trying to figure out its train of thought, it's got to be able to share its half-baked conjectures with evolutionary learning for feedback. With an evolutionary learning, when it still has a bad evolved population that hasn't converged near an answer yet, it needs to consult <clears throat> a logic engine for, say, fitness estimation or new, you know, inductive or abductive reasoning based guesses about what to do next. And if you have that sort of crosstalk, then then you can pr progress faster. Now, with with LLMs, it's actually a hard thing to do right now because there's no really good way to inject ideas from other AI tools into the internal processing of, of an, an LLM, right? There, 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 there's, no, there's no good way to do that right now. The other way can work. Like you can, you can take a vector embedding of the intermediate state of an LLM while it's doing something. And you can use that, that vector embedding to help guide a logic engine in interacting with the, with the, with the LLM. And sometimes the vector embedding of the internal state of an LLM can be more informative than the actual out, output of the, of the, uh, of the LLM, which is, which is, is, is interesting. Like you can, you can get a more reliable answer out of an LLM by looking internal state than just by querying for, 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 for an answer, right? So then there's, but you can't take something from an or external AI tool and there's not a really good way to use it to guide what the LLM is doing. I mean, you could, you could try to like clamp some neurons in, in, in a certain way to guide the attention mechanism, but it's, it's not, it's not impossible, right? So you, if you think about how a transformer attention mechanism works, I mean, you can, you can insert an extra matrix in there, which come from an external system, like a logical or evolutionary learning system. And then you're using the external system to help guide, to help guide the, the attention, right? And that's, that's sort of how like a tree transformer works, where in a tree transformer that comes from a formal grammar, but it comes from somewhere besides, come, so you come from somewhere besides a formal grammar. So you, you could, you could use an external AI system to guide attention 
what we don't have is a good way to use an external system to guide learn, learning, to guide the basic training of the base model in the, in, in the transformer. And we also don't have a scalable way to do online learning, like real-time updating of the base weights of a transformer model. It's learned in a, in a batch mode, which is, is bad, for, bad for AGI. So I think either you need some fundamental refactoring of transformers, or ultimately you need something besides transformers to really get cognitive synergy to, to work full on. And I, I mean, I've thought a bunch with Alexei Ponopov, one of my AGI colleagues in, in the OpenCog project and in, in SingularityNet and our company, True AGI. I've, we've talked a bunch about how would you do something transformer-like within the OpenCog atom space? Because in OpenCog, the core knowledge representation is this knowledge graph, this big weighted labeled hypergraph. And you can do logic, you can do evolution, you can do neural net stuff all in this graph. On the other hand, right now, transformers don't work that way. And you, I mean, you can also interface from this knowledge graph to external systems, like, like a, you know, a CNN for vision or, or, or a transformer neural net for language. You can interface pretty tightly with these external systems. On the other hand, if you want a really rich cognitive synergy, that's hard unless the external system is instrumented to share its immediate states and to accept guidance into its intermediate states. And most AI systems are not built like that. So often the best way to get cognitive synergy is to implement all your different AI algorithms inside one sort of meta-representational fabric, which is like the open cog atom space. So then if we implement something transformer-like inside the open cog knowledge graph, I mean, then, then it will be much more straightforward to get richer cognitive synergy between transformers and logic engines, evolutionary learning and so on. But on the other hand, we don't need that to get some mileage out of transformers for AGI. For, for example, we have a team working on what's called semantic parsing, which is using transformers to translate English into formal logic expressions. It's taking an English sentence, output predicate or term logic expression with the same meaning as that sentence, largely but wholly disambiguated. So if we can get transformers to work for doing that, I mean, you don't know, need cognitive synergy to get mileage out of that. It's just like, okay, then we have the whole internet translated into a set of logical expressions that we can reason on in our reasoning engine, right? So, I mean, there, there's, I mean, you could also use transformers as, as like, uh, not entirely reliable, but very broad question answering oracle, right? So like you, you have a logical reasoning system thinking about stuff. You have an evolution of learning and new ideas. It can ask questions or bounce ideas off the transformer. You get the answers back from the transformer, feed them back into to your open code system. There you're leveraging the fact that the transformer has so much knowledge baked into it. Because like say, I mean, as an example, we might feed all of Wikipedia and PubMed into an open cog atom space, and that's cool, but it may not be tractable at the moment, the whole web into it. Whereas the transformer is a very, in a way, compacted version of the whole web. So you, you can use using the transformer as a unreliable but broad question answering oracle, right? So that on, on the one end, to really bring transformers fully into your cognitive synergy world, you need to radically re-implement transformers. On the other hand, to get a bunch of mileage out of transformers, you can use that one remove, and they're just not part of your core AGI engine, but it may still give a huge boost to your core to your AGI engine. Right? That that is so helpful. That the the examples you gave of cognitive synergy make it so much more concrete and uh yeah, just uh, digestible. That that was that was super helpful. I'm wondering about um, the. I have to ask a little bit about consciousness, um, and I know this is like the philosopher has to always talk about consciousness. But I I wonder with the with the atom space, 
and the cognitive synergy going on and it's, you know, non-modular, these things are tightly connected. Do you think, do you think the atom space would be conscious? I know you've, you've said you go in for panpsychism. Do you think that there's a, a combination uh, going on where there's like a singular thing? Is, is it hy- hyper on? Yeah. I mean, my, my best hypothesis at the moment is yes. Once you get an open cog hyper on atom space, which is carrying out vaguely human-like cognitive processes, even if not exactly human-like, it will have a vaguely human-like conscious ex- ex- experience. Right? And, and I, 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 I mean that I see no reason not to think that. I think the species of panpsychism that I gravitate towards pushes in that in that direction right if everything is conscious but everything's are conscious in their own special ways i mean probably the most dominant organizational and dynamical patterns in the system become the most dominant experiential patterns and the consciousness associated with that with that system i would say a naive functionalism would push you in the same direction right the naive functionalism would say well okay it's it's quacks like a conscious system. It walks like a conscious system. It probably is a conscious system, right? Now I'm I'm open to this being false, which would vex but intrigue me, right? I mean, I think if we tried a sort of brain computer interfacing thing, where like I wire my brain into a brick, I wire my brain into my phone, I wire my brain into my hat, I wire my brain into Sophia. I wire my brain into open cog. You know, if if we do this sort of brain computer interfacing, and it seems like wiring our brain into an ape feels like a lot. Wiring our brain into a neuroid in a petri dish feels like a lot. Wiring my brain into an open cog system feels like wiring my brain into a brick. I mean that that will be vexing, and I will start trying to think through the foundations, and I will start asking, like, what if I wire my brain into a quantum computer running a quantum reasoning system or something, right? So, I mean, I I, I wouldn't 100% rule out that somehow consciousness is tied in with some voodoo aspect of, like, wet quantum mechanics in the brain, but I give that, like, a 1% odds of being true. I, 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 re- I really doubt it's true. But I want to have a healthy respect for my my ignorance about everything under the sun and beyond the sun. I uh, so at at the conference last year, in a Q and A portion of uh, David Chalmers, one of David Chalmers' talks, you talked about plugging yourself into a brick, and I think about it maybe once a week. I just look at a brick. I really like, and I plug my yeah, yeah. You know, my oldest my, son and I have had a lot of profound experiences with with that with rocks. I mean, if you ever if you ever take mushrooms out in the, in New Mexico, I mean, you can you can get quite quite into the psychology of all these rock faces out there in a, in a certain certain state state of experience, right? But but yet yet they're not dynamic in the same way on the t- same time scale as, as, as we are, right? So I mean, that, there's a lot going on in the brick at the quantum mechanical level, but it's it's not the same kind of cognitive system as 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 we are right so like somehow what would have to be true for an open cog with human level agi not to have human level consciousness would have to be that the consciousness was more about like the differences in the molecular and cellular level processing versus about the actual stuff that you're thinking about which clearly occurs in the higher level organizational level and Nothing in neuroscience points in that direction, right? Like everything in neuroscience is like if you poke the brain with some electrodes, the way it impacts our reported conscious experience is quite tied in with the high level, like cell assembly, electrical activity patterns in, in the brain. Like from everything we've seen in cognitive neuroscience, it seems like experienced human consciousness is really closely tied with higher level, like 
electrical patterns in in in, in cell assemblies, right? It, it does not actually seem to be tied with what's going on in the microtubules of an individual neuron or something. So, I mean, if if we're paying attention to cognitive neuroscience, it also points in the same direction as a naive functionalism or or a commonsensical panpsychism. But I, I, I mean, we don't want to be hubristic like like we there's a lot we don't know about about the universe right so yeah yeah uh it's that's that's really helpful i i wonder um okay so i like your i like your thought experiment about using like a brain plug-in to test stuff for consciousness if you did test yeah uh, open cog I, 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 I will i will do it i will do it as soon as it's available i will be i'll be the first guinea yeah. pig for that for the plug <laughs> i will I will go live on That's, YouTube using my mind with that of a brick and then see what happens. That would be awesome, man. I'm I'm looking forward to that. So let's say um let's say you plug in and you get definitive evidence that Hyperon is not conscious and uh, maybe maybe you can draw a, a inference or you get some other kind of evidence that AGI is not conscious or couldn't be conscious. Would that make the whole project? meaningless or would that just be like oh oh well it's it it doesn't really matter whether or not it's conscious it what matters is the product it would be the, incredibly uh, useful in the sense that i mean it will be incredibly useful in the sense so i mean independent of whether it's conscious or not it will be if you had an agi system that's smarter than people i mean you'll be able to do science engineering medicine governance all these things better better than people right so i mean an AGI system that had no conscious experience could still create an era of superabundance for human beings and could still solve the science problems involved in upgrading our brains to make us biological superminds, right? I mean, what it would it would mean two things. It would mean I would view uploading myself into an open cloud system quite differently, right? Because uploading yourself into a conscious open cloud system. You would say like, well, maybe that could replace this meat then, right? Uploading yourself into a non-conscious open cog system will be a useful digital twin. It could carry out practical functions for me and let me multitask, but it wouldn't be me in, in the same sense. The other thing is, if you think about, well, maybe humanity will fade away over time because everyone will upload into the transhuman mind matrix. It'll be kind of a tragedy if consciousness obsoleted itself by all conscious beings mind uploading themselves into non-conscious intelligence, right? Sort of. I mean, there must and there must be SF stories like this from, from 1955 or, 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 or something, right? So on the other hand, my immediate next step then would be to build OpenCog Tachyon, which will be the quantum computer version, and then see if mind melding with that you get a feeling of amazing consciousness, right? Because then the next question will be like, okay, what's the consciousness of a quantum computer version of your open cloud system? Then you'd ask, okay, what's the consciousness of a quantum computer version of open cloud made with nickel and silicon versus a quantum computer open cloud built in a, in a neuroid with a special structure or something, right? So, I mean, I mean there, there, would be, there would be a whole empirical empirical pursuit of like, what does the infrastructure have to be to manifest consciousness? This is fun from a science fiction view, but like I said, I'm I'm 99% sure what we're going to find is the naive functionalists are, are basically right, and the conscious experience relatively closely follows the high-level organizational and, 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 and dynamical patterns in, 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 in the system, right? Which, which doesn't mean that materialism is right, is is all there is it could be i mean dualism is also consistent with that right what 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 it, what it just means is the nature of conscious experience is heavily correlated with the high level structure and dynamical patterns in, in in the system with which the experience is associated and that everything i know from every branch of science points in that direction but uh, 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 i mean still we don't know now you know you interviewed selmer right so selmer brings is a hyper computationalist right like he he thinks a turing machine or a quant 
or a quantum computer, which is in the end equivalent to a Turing machine, modulo changes in average time compute speed. I mean, so he believes neither a Turing machine nor a quantum Turing machine can be human level general intelligent. He thinks you need trans Turing hypercomputation to be human level general intelligent, right? And I, I doubt it. I very much doubt it. I will admit that nothing in what we currently know, according to our imprecise standards of solid scientific knowledge, but we, even according to the imprecise standards by which we judge knowledge in science, like we don't, we don't know, we don't know that, that he's wrong. And I, I have a weird view to his uh, weird perspective on his hypothesis because I, I do feel like hyper hypercomputation is real in, in, in a sense. I think, I think in some meaning, meaningful metaphysical sense, hypercomputation exists. I even think that I can touch it experientially and I have a intuitive quail, quail level sense of what it is to be a hypercomputer. But I, I don't think, I still don't think you need a hypercomputer in this physical universe somehow. I don't think you need a hybrid computer to do human level general intelligence. I, I, I mean, I, I think, I think hypercomputation exists in some sense that's outside our space time continuum, which is, which is fine. But I don't think that means, I don't think that stops you from building a digital computer, which is a Turing machine running open cog or something and having that manifest general intelligence in the same way that, that, that a human brain does. Like, I, I don't think the human brain has a relation to hypercomputation that's somehow privileged or different than what a digital, compu digital computer could, could have, right? I, 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 just think, I just think all of science and all of our space-time continuum, maybe a tiny speck in some broader, broader realm of existence that in, in some way we can get an intuitive feel of. And post-singularity, we may have an entirely different view of what the mind is, which is massively broader than current science touches. But I, I sort of think, I feel like it's a little bogus to use that sort of spiritual insight, which I know Selmer shares in a way, but in, in, in a different way, because he's a serious... Christian, whereas I, I'm certainly not, right? But I mean, I, I, I think not being reductionist and not being a naive functionalist doesn't stop you from thinking you could build a digital computer system like OpenCog and it could be conscious in as rich a sense as, 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 as a human mind and, and, and brain is. But that this, this gets really deep into a, we'd have to do a whole other podcasts on, on cosmic consciousness right. At, right. at some point that we can, that we yeah. can pull uh, ESP and reincarnation and lots of other fun stuff into it. But, uh, but that'd I, be I, awesome. Yeah. I've got another, I've got another meeting in, in, in a few minutes. So I had, I don't have time to, to dig into that right now. But, um, I got just, just one more for you here. Um, and it's, yeah, it's based on that last one. Do you think, this this is uh, maybe two out there, but do you think a, an AGI system could ever have a psychedelic experience? Well, yeah. I mean, I think it's the problem is stopping it from having a psychedelic experience. I, I, I mean, uh, in the late ninety in the late nineties, I, I I realized that the early stage AGI systems I was playing with then had two default modes: tripping out or obsessive compulsive, and trying trying to get it not wow. to do one of those things, trying to get not to do one of those things was really, re 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 really the challenge. Like, I mean, already LLMs are very good at hallucinating in, in a shallow sort of way, but sure. I mean, getting an open, like, yeah. getting an open cog out of space to trip out and imagine wild shit without any filter and hallucinate stuff is not actually that hard. And getting it to obsessively bear down and solving a narrow sort of problem is not that hard. 
the harder thing is getting to be in between those two extremes, which is is a feat that we that we manage to to pull off uh, regularly. This this in a way goes back to Julian Jaynes and the origin of consciousness and then and the structure of the bicameral mind, right? Where he was he was he was he was looking at uh, you know hallucination as part of the key to the origin of modern modern consciousness. Right? So he he he. Oh, he, yeah. he thought it's a stoned that, ape, yeah. No, no. I mean, it may relate to that, but it's 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 more modern. What he was saying, he th- okay. he thought that when Homer wrote Ulysses and the Odyssey, he thought that he was really hearing in his head the voices of the gods dictate stuff to him. So his his, his hypothesis was that until a few thousand years ago, we didn't have an inner narrative. Instead, we thought it was the gods talking to us. Sort of like what we now call paranoid schizophrenia, right? Mm. Or an aspect of what we now call paranoid schizophrenia. Then he thought that the emergence of modern consciousness over the last few years was the internalization of what previously was experienced as the voice of the gods into our own inner monologue and, 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 and internal narrative, right? Wow. And I mean, I don't, I don't fully buy into his theory. I think it's interesting, but I mean, we, I don't know how to empirically validate it. Because we we it's hard to run that experiment. It will be interesting too. But uh, I think, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's in the same. It, it's uh, somehow in in the same spirit of of your question. And that like I- integrating yeah. crazy out there hallucinogenic stuff with bearing down on a single problem stuff is hard. It, it's sort of like how does the default mode versus versus the uh, the uh, sort of focused mode of consciousness in the human brain work together like we we sort of have two modes one of which is focused on solving a specific problem at hand the other is like mm-hmm. chilling out and literally thinking and getting those to work together is super hard now tripping out is arguably a different mode than, than either of those which is which is is interesting. I think a, a question that's more interesting to me is whether a digital AGI can have a, a psychic experience like ESP or, 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 pre- or precognition. Right? Yeah. Or do, do you need do you need yeah. some quantum voodoo inserted in in, in, in in the brain to do that? Like it could it could be that human level general intelligence is possible for a digital computer, but psychic powers are only possible for for quantum computer or or not right mm-hmm. like there's so much there's so much that, that we don't know and one but one of the promises of building human level agi which will rapidly upload into transhuman superintelligence and one of the promises here is just having a different sort of mind with different capabilities and strengths to be able to help solve all these all these problems right because there's so much we don't understand, so much we don't understand. We're incredibly ignorant about ourselves and the universe. But one thing we do seem to understand—at least I think I understand—is how to build a mind that's smarter than us, right? And if that, because we understand that one thing, then have a key to then leverage that to understand all all these other things, which is is, is quite amazing. Yeah, that is. Well, Ben, thanks so much for your time. Uh, there's so much more to talk about. You you know uh, an insane amount. So uh, I'm looking forward to hopefully getting you back on the podcast again. Thanks so much for for everything. We should, we should do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th- oh, thanks for having me. It's a different perspective than most of the tech podcasts that, that, that I deal with. And I think it's it's really important to take a sort of broader philosophy-powered view view of these of these things because I mean, as as lame and confusing as philosophy is, it manages in some ways to get a higher level of abstraction than any other intellectual discipline that we have. And we need that level of abstraction when we're dealing with with a world that's leaping beyond the previously known, you know, with, with, with such astounding rapidity. Yes, totally. I'm I'm definitely clipping that. That's a good that's a good clip right there. Awesome. All right. Well, that's going to have to do it for now, folks. This has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory to God.